Welcome to the Wolf Connection Podcast. I'm your host, John Kalfa. Let's talk about some wolves. Uh, it is our pleasure to have on the podcast today with Stephen and myself coming from his residence in Bozeman, Montana. He just finished 14 years as a state legislature, as a Democrat in Montana, six in the House, eight years in the Senate. He also does a, a ton of work for wolf recovery programs, which we'll get to today. Mike Phillips, uh, pleasure to have you on the podcast. How are you doing, sir? Yeah, John, Steve, it's great to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to offer a few thoughts. Absolutely. Yeah, we want to jump. Yeah, we want to jump right in, Mike, because you've been a huge proponent of the reintroduction of wolves back into Colorado. Stephen actually is partly residing there. He's in Durango at the moment. So, how did you start on this? I want to say crusade because you were serving in Montana at the time to really spearhead the project and the proposition to reintroduce wolves in Colorado. Well, John, actually, the story goes uh, back many, many years. I have been working on wolf recovery and conservation on, for all intent and purposes, a daily basis since uh, 1985, 1986. I was honored to lead the Red Wolf Restoration effort in the Southeast. That was, for the record, the first attempt in the history of humankind to restore carnivore species that had been declared extinct in the wild. Wow. Uh, after that, I was honored to serve as the first leader of the Yellowstone Wolf Restoration Project. Uh, it was there that I met Ted Turner, uh, now nearly a quarter century ago, and Ted and I concluded that there was a great opportunity to amplify the importance of private land for endangered species conservation. So I left the Department of Interior to co-found with Ted Turner, the Turner Endangered Species Fund and Turner Biodiversity Divisions. They have stood since inception as the world's most significant private effort to redress the extinction crisis through active reintroduction projects. In that regard, we have been very involved in wolf recovery and conservation throughout the United States. We, for example, since 1998 have maintained the only private captive breeding and pre-release facility for Mexican wolves in the world. I've served on every Mexican wolf recovery team that's been convened since 1995. Uh, we provided a top shelf field biologist to advance wolf recovery in the Northern Rocky Mountains for many, many years. And it was in that capacity of pushing forward on wolf recovery that, that struck me as plainly apparent that the job of recovery uh, could not be uh, considered complete until wolves had been restored to the Southern Rockies ecoregion. That ecoregion, uh, John and Stephen, is mostly Western Colorado. Not only is it ideally suited for gray wolves with nearly 17, with over, sorry, over 17 million acres of federal public lands that would be available to gray wolves that support an abundant biomass of native prey, uh, an abundance of prey unlike what gray wolves have access to, I believe, anywhere in the world. Uh, so ecologically, it's highly suitable for gray wolves, but from a landscape perspective, uh, once a viable population would occupy the great wildlands, the great public wildlands of Western Colorado, they would serve as the archstone, connecting wolf populations from the high Arctic to the Mexican border. There's, there's no other place in the world, fellas, where you can imagine restoring an imperiled large carnivore across a continental landscape. And to achieve mm. that here in North America, to achieve that here in the United States, requires one thing, one more thing, and that's the return of the species to the great public wildlands of Western Colorado. So given my work with the federal government and my uh, uh, work as the conservation scientist, uh, I, I am well aware of the importance and have known for a long time now of the importance of restoring gray wolves to western colorado that that john is a bit of the background so yeah just some uh some notes for everyone who's listening so yeah field coordinator for the red wolf recovery project from 86 to 94 94 to 97 project leader wolf restoration ever in yellowstone and then you've been with ted turner's foundation uh, basically since, like you said, 1997 through present. So yeah, Mike is a huge background in this, former biologist. Uh, John, just to clarify, uh, Ted has a great philanthropic heart 
a big appetite for change and has supported many foundations. The Turner Endangered Species Fund is, is different. Ted and I co-founded that in 1997 as an operational charity. We, we don't issue grants. We are a collection of field biologists that conceive, uh, design, and implement field projects based on reintroduction efforts on behalf of imperiled species in close cooperation with state and federal agencies. So in that regard, we're not a traditional foundation. We are really an operational shop that puts our boots on the ground every day to make the world a better place for the lesser among us. Yeah, so when um, so this is the first of us hearing or at least talking about a private recovery effort. So when you say rep- private recovery effort, what's, what's the sense of how the efficacy of recovery projects are different when they're initialized by a private versus a federal entity? Well, Stephen, it's a fine question, and it is true that private entities can sometimes move quickly, more quickly than a state or federal government. That That's true. Uh, we, we don't have the constituency of the federal government. The federal government has to serve all Americans. Mm-hmm. We, we don't have the constituency of Colorado Parks and Wildlife, CPW, Colorado Parks and Wildlife. They, that agency has to serve all Coloradans. Uh, we really only serve uh, our own desire to make the better the world a better place and our board of trustees and that allows us to move quickly sometimes now that said with most of our projects because we focus on listed species either listed as threatened or endangered under state law or threatened or endangered under federal law we can't move absent state or federal permits so, so we are very closely aligned with state and federal agencies. We are proud of our relationship with those agencies. We believe in government. We, we believe government is an important part of making the future better. And, and so while we do move quickly, uh, we don't cut corners. If anything, we add corners to make sure that our federal and state partners know that what they see from us is exactly what they're going to get. Yeah, I want to I want to expound upon that because it was we like I said before we started we spoke with a former colleague of yours Carter Niemeyer who was also in deep with the Wolf Recovery Project, you know, when it first began and there were obviously heads that were butted either way from, you know, government agencies and individuals that were private landowners who sort of butted heads and weren't really fans of the government. How do you guys balance that out and make it such a good working relationship that, that you and, and Ted Turner are able to, to do these projects and move forward in a, in a positive way? Well, we're certainly mindful of our neighbors. And uh, we, we don't expect our vision to be our neighbor's vision. And, and some of the species that we work with do cause concern on the behalf of our neighbors. For example, uh, there's lots of people that don't like the idea of restoring prairie dogs. And yet we probably are the nation's most successful farmers of prairie dogs. We have translocated and released over 15,000 prairie dogs to establish new colonies as habitat for the critically endangered black-footed ferret. But we don't expect our embrace of the prairie dog ferret system to be our neighbor's embrace. And so we develop techniques that ensure that our prairie dog program doesn't spill over to the neighbors. And then we work with state and federal agencies to ensure that those species that we work with that don't recognize property boundaries, Aplomato falcons, for example, we put in place administrative provisions that allow for Aplomato falcons to not become a problem for a neighboring landowner. Ultimately, with these projects that connect to great big landscapes, Aplomato Falcons in the Southwest, for example, the the programs really are driven by the federal government. And we serve as an important operative helping the federal government advance recovery. But ultimately, without the federal government involved, we don't have sufficient authority to extend our work beyond the confines of Turner Ranches. So, so for example, with wolf recovery in Colorado, people said to me for many years, well, why don't you just get the permit and, and you let gray wolves go? I said, well, first and foremost, uh, we don't command enough authority 
mm. to operate over that landscape, even in the presence of permits. Mm. But because we don't command enough authority, we'd never get the permits. We don't have the capacity to account for the liability issues that might come up. So you can imagine that we are something akin to a straw stirring a much bigger drink. And the much bigger drink is the activities of the United States Fish and Wildlife Service under the Federal Endangered Species Act, or to drill down a bit more deeply, when we did the historic work restoring endangered desert bighorn sheep to the Fra Cristobal Mountains of the Armanderas Ranch in central New Mexico, we were really operating in close cooperation with and under the authority of the New Mexico Department of Fish and Game. At the end of the day, recovering desert bighorn sheep in New Mexico is a party that the state of New Mexico has to host. We just happen to be a favored invited guest, if mm. you will. So our work is mindful of how far afield we can go. And we are very proud to be what I think is a pretty effective straw stirring these bigger drinks. And I want to touch back on something you said earlier before about feeding in that gap that you were talking about between, you know, the Arctic, you know, Canadian Montana, where the wolves are currently and where the gray, uh, the uh, red wolf population is in the southwestern United States. What's the, what's the impact of having that gap filled and making sure that the wolf can range, like you said, through the entire continental United States, at least in that section? Well, John, it's a great question. Thank you. But for, first, uh, uh, and I know you just misspoke, pal. I know you understand that it's the Mexican wolf. The Mexican Canis wolf, Canis rufus balei that occupies the southwestern part of the United States. Canis rufus, the red wolf, is a native of the southeastern part of the country. But at, 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 anyway, uh, so why does the middle matter? Why does the middle matter? Mm -hmm. Well, it matters for legal reasons, and we can explain. I can explain why it matters for legal reasons. It matters for uh, genetic reasons as well. When I speak about wolves being connected from the high Arctic to the Mexican border, really what I'm imagining is a meta population, a population of populations of gray wolves that extend from the high Arctic to the Mexican border. It doesn't mean that there's not gaps in that distribution. There surely are, but gray wolves are good enough about crossing gaps that you could ensure good genetic exchange uh, from the high Arctic all the way to the Mexican border with time. And that kind of genetic exchange ensures the genetic health of these populations over a long period of time. And, and we know that genetic diversity matters. Ultimately, at the end of the day, nature is driven by genes. The coronavirus is good at uh, evolving because it's got a genetic makeup that wants to perpetuate itself. Uh, one, one can make a case that evolution is all about genes. Uh, and, and there's a wonderful book written many years ago entitled The Selfish Gene. There's some wisdom that would say natural selection operates at the genetic level because it matters so. So, so this genetic connection matters. Uh, ecologically, we know filling the middle makes a difference because the balance of the wildlands of Colorado is not as complete as it should be. We know that gray wolves as a predator, an obligate carnivore, living mostly on live prey that it kills. Let I me mean, clarify, no self-respecting wolf would ever walk by a free meal. So they're more than willing to scavenge. But for the most part, gray wolves survive by killing things. As an ecological process, predation is very important. And right now it's not fully expressed in Western Colorado because an important native carnivore, and that being the gray wolf is absent. From, from a symbolic perspective, plugging the middle matters. But we have all kinds of examples where humanity is good at pushing nature into the dark, deep recesses of the extinction crisis. It's nice from a symbolic perspective, if on occasion we can remind mm -hmm. ourselves of the power of restoration, remind ourselves that restoration is an alternative to extinction. Colorado and wolves have great potential to illuminate that simple fact, the simple fact that restoration is an alternative to extinction. Now, your listeners might say, well, gee whiz, Mike, why does that matter? Well, fellas, we are in the grips of the sixth great extinction crisis. 
And when you look across the long sweep of time that this planet has supported multicellular life for 500 million years, that this planet has supported multicellular life, there have been five, uh, previously, five great extinction crises. We are in the midst of the sixth great extinction crisis. So first and foremost, we have to acknowledge that these crises are very unusual. They come about very, very infrequently. This particular crisis, the sixth great extinction crisis, is due entirely to the activities of humankind. We are the cause of the sixth great extinction crisis. Now, why should that matter? I would have you believe, fellas, that no matter who you are, the extinction crisis should matter. Well, let's imagine for a moment that you're a person of faith. How can you love the creator and not love the creation? Mm. And, and how can you stand by and watch something you love needlessly destroyed without rising up in defense? Or let's assume that you're a secular humanist and you believe rather than faith, it's data, logic, empiricism that matter. Well, the best science makes clear that the fate of humanity is and will always be a function of the health of local landscapes around the world. And yet the extinction crisis makes clear that local landscapes around the world are not the least bit healthy. No matter who you are, the extinction crisis should matter. Wolf restoration to the great public wildlands of Western Colorado draws important attention to this critically uh, insidious problem that's growing ever more so, that being the sixth great extinction crisis. Um, so there's a quote that I was reading in uh, a piece that I was, I, I just read this morning about you. Um, you said, I'm not here to lobby anybody to vote any particular way that's up to Coloradans, but I am here to share what I understand to be reliable science. Are the, are the feelings about wolves at this point, whether positive or negative, just way beyond that, or does communicating the clear science as you're mentioning right now, um, is that a way forward? Is that changing people's minds where it needs to and affirming this, this, the importance of the reintroduction? Probably not, mm. uh, and probably not in part because uh, people are a stubborn lot, <laughs> right. especially my tribe, and I, I can pick on my tribe. Uh, older white men are notoriously stubborn, keenly inclined to not change our minds. Even when presented with good information, what we tend to do rather than change our minds is dig our heels in the ground and become more stubborn. So probably not. I believe that there's a great deal of good that can become come, that can come from educating children. And I, I'd even consider teenagers and uh, you know college students to be children, I suppose, in some way, still willing to say, oh, geez, I never thought of it that way. That's a pretty good idea. <laughs> but as we mature, we become more stubborn. So I, I, I do believe what I said, uh, Coloradans have every right to vote, yes or no. They, and they have voted. You know, it's important that yep. your listeners understand Wolf Restoration Proposition 114 did pass in November of 2020. It is now law, law that the state of Colorado shall conduct reintroductions by December of 23 to restore a viable population. Uh, did our educational effort move the electoral needle much? I doubt it. I think that Coloradans had a sensibility about them that predisposed Proposition 114 to passing for reasons unrelated to our education campaign. My gosh, fellas, if education mattered, why would people walk and wearing masks? And, you know, I can't speak about folks in other countries, but I can say, and, and I not only was in the legislature for 14 years, I've been a conservation scientist for a long time, leading very controversial and endangered species programs, and I was a talk show radio talk show host. I was the lone progressive voice in AM 1450 K MMS every Friday afternoon from four to six o'clock. I had a drive time show. Uh, I don't think most folks are too terribly inclined to change their mind. Wow. So, yeah. We, no, but come on, Stephen, in your life, have you found people? <laughs> come on in? I don't think my experience is unique. No. No, I think I think your experience is spot on, man. Yeah. And I wish the basic science would. I mean, what you just said there, if I didn't if I didn't agree with 
uh, Colorado reintroduction. This would make me, I mean, this would make me a fan. Like just the basic science, but also this, um, you know, this idea that filling filling the middle is really a sign of true restoration. And if the middle is filled, it matters on a scientific basis that true genetic, you know, it's a sign that true genetic diversity is happening, and therefore securing a long term success for the species. I'm not sure what else anybody needs, but to get more into the uh, Colorado specifics. I was talking to a young studying biologist not too long ago. The calving rate of the elk herd here is his main concern. And if this herd is already compromised and wolves are reintroduced to the landscape, I imagine they are going to have an initial impact on this herd, especially being that they are completely unfamiliar with this level of predation. But long term, do you see the reintroduction of wolves restoring some kind of natural balance back to the Colorado landscape? There's no doubt in my mind that wolf predation can sometimes create noticeable and some would consider negative impacts on a local ungulate population. So the student that you talk to that might Mm -hmm. uh, have some awareness of a local elk population and is concerned about the calving rate, I'm quite confident wolf predation is not going to help that elk herd. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's true. But when you look at Western Colorado and Toto, here's what we know from the state's own survey data. And, and because game species have value, they're, they really have value all across the United States, white-tailed deer, Rocky Mountain elk, mule deer, uh, moose, pronghorn. These ungulates have great value because people like to hunt them. To, to be real honest, they like to hunt them. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. So states are very good at counting these ungulates in the field. So survey data matter. Uh, The state of Colorado's own elk and deer survey data show from 2014 to 2018, I haven't looked at 19 and 20 data yet, but from 2004 to 2018, the state of Colorado reports after recreational hunters have killed about 80,000 deer and elk on an annual basis, after they've killed about 80,000 deer and elk, there remain on the ground over 650,000 deer and elk. Okay, so let's think about that. That's a lot of deer and elk. Hmm, how does that compare to what we know is happening elsewhere? Let's just look at Western Colorado relative to the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. We sat out there many years ago to restore gray wolves to the GYE by reintroducing animals to Yellowstone National Park. Contrary to popular belief, the aim of our releases was never to simply restore gray wolves to Yellowstone Park. The aim was always to use the highly secure, suitable habitat of Yellowstone as a way to restore the species to the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, which is the park and surrounding national forest lands that cover about 15 million acres. And those 15 million acres support about 250,000 deer and elk, and now support about 350 to 500 gray wolves. In other words, a very viable population of gray wolves. Using the greater Yellowstone ecosystem as a proxy for Western Colorado, here's what we see. At least as much federal public land in Colorado as the GYE, if not more, and three or four times more deer and elk after hunters have killed an average of 80,000 deer and elk. In other words, there is tremendous potential for Western Colorado to support a viable population of gray wolves and still also support a very viable big game hunting industry in the Western half of Colorado. When you look at the Northern Rocky Mountains, Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho, there is no evidence, none whatsoever, that gray wolf restoration has impacted big game hunting opportunities. Now, there are some areas where your honey hole may not be quite as productive as it used to be. You might have to drive another 70 miles to get to another fine spot to hunt deer elk. But across the states of Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho, there are still robust opportunities, sometimes record opportunities to hunt deer and elk, despite the fact that the Northern Rocky Mountains support 1,500 to 2,000 gray wolves. In other words, gray wolves and big game hunters can get along just fine, thank you very much. And I haven't even invoked big game hunting in the Great Lakes states. There's a boatload of big game hunters in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. 
and white-tailed deer are a fantastic big game species. And yet, with thousands of gray wolves in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan, we see no interruption of big game hunting opportunities in those three states. So I would say to the student, in certain areas, of course, gray wolf predation combined with other methods of offtake, like human hunters and coyotes and cougars and black bears, and in the northern Rocky Mountains, grizzly bears, an ungulate population can be suppressed. But for the most part, what we're seeing across large regions, that suppression has not interrupted one bit big game hunting opportunities. Have Has there been any discussion also about the CWD, the chronic wasting disease that is slowly, well, actually it's almost quickly now making its way across the country from those northern states, Minnesota, Wisconsin. I know there was, I, I believe, a couple of cases that are they're inching towards Yellowstone. It, I know you put in a couple of articles that I read too that th- that gray wolf reintroduction could actually thin out those diseased animals as well. Is that a talking point that you guys try and hammer home a little bit as well to say that it, it it's it's a natural way of ridding the herds and of these diseased animals because the hunters are not being able to eat the meat that they shoot because they have to test, you know, the deer or the elk or the moose, whatever they take home. Well, John, it's a great question. First, let me point out, they can eat it. You, yeah. you can, you can submit your animal for testing and you, your mule deer might come back positive for chronic wasting disease. You can eat the meat. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm not sure it's transferred to humans successfully mm-hmm. yet, huh? Well, the Center for Disease Control and the World Health Organization both recommend against eating meat yeah. from animals that are CWD positive. But I mean, should everybody gets to make their own choice. Right. And as right. we think about chronic wasting disease, we have to be mindful that its zoonotic potential is greater than zero. A, a, a zoonotic disease is a, de- a disease that goes from wildlife to humans. Co- COVID-19 Uh, The disease caused caused by the coronavirus is a zoonotic disease. Mm -hmm. Uh, CWD could become a zoonotic disease. Now, the interesting thing about CWD, it's always fatal. Now, you you think about that. The coronavirus has given rise to a global pandemic because of the disease that it causes, COVID-19. And it has a notable rate of lethality at 2%, 3%. Over half, over 500,000 Americans have died from COVID-19. It is a consequential problem. The mortality rate from CWD is 100%. If it becomes a zoonotic disease, we've got a real problem on our hands. Now, what makes CWD even more insidious, it's not caused by something that's alive. It, the coronavirus is alive and you can cause it to go away if it destroys habitat. That's what the vaccination program is all about, fundamentally making your body bad habitat for the coronavirus so it can't mm-hmm. perpetuate itself. Mm-hmm. Chronic wasting disease is not caused by something that's alive. You can't kill it. Mm-hmm. Chronic wasting mm-hmm. disease is caused by a misshapen protein. It's not alive or dead. It just is. And, and, and because of its nature, it, it tends to cause other proteins to themselves become misshapen, and that brings about this wasting disease. Now, what further makes it even more insidious, it doesn't happen right away. Sometimes the ailments of CWD don't manifest themselves for a year or two or three. Right. It's a slowly creeping disease. So you can be lulled into a sense of false security. Oh, no, no, we're okay. We're okay. We, we're not seeing many deer or elk that are diseased. Well, what you're seeing may not be exactly what's percolating right under the surface. What also makes it tough, these proteins can apparently persist in the environment for an extended period of time, either in the water or in the soil. There's some evidence now that these proteins are actually taken up by plants as they grow and the the growth of the plant embeds this misshapen protein in its tissue. An elk comes by and he eats that, that plant. And now that elk has inadvertently consumed these misshapen proteins, these prions. That's what the misshapen protein is called. It's called a prion. And all of a sudden, the disease has a new host, that particular elk that it ate that plant. This is a really nasty set of circumstances. So you ask yourself, 
what can you do? What can you do to keep a lid on chronic wasting disease? It is now a problem for many, many ungular populations around the United States, including, for example, Western Colorado. Notably, CWD first arose, or at least was first documented in Colorado. Most states would have you believe the best way to keep a lid on the prevalence of chronic wasting disease is through a more aggressive hunting program. In other words, let's kill the animals that have the disease, get them out of the population so they can't serve as a vector. That's fine. That's fine. And we should all admit that a human hunter is just a predator exercising the act of predation, typically with a shotgun or a rifle. So you think about all of that. It simply makes good common sense that wolf predation would serve as an assist if your desire is to limit the extent and, 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 and uh, uh, distribution of CWD, all of the native predators are serving the same role as a human hunter. They're killing the animal that could be the vector. Now let's think about that one step further. Gray wolves, because their lives are so very difficult and because they're so poorly suited to their lives of predation, gray wolves are very good at selecting for disease compromised animals. If they're not very good at selecting for animals that are predisposed to predation, that gray wolf goes hungry. Gray wolves don't wanna go hungry, so they become very, very good at finding animals that are somehow predisposed. Well, I can't imagine a more effective predisposing factor than chronic wasting disease. Consequently, what we believe is the case is that these predators that select for disease compromised prey should be good at assisting in the management of chronic wasting disease. Now, are there a raft of data that show this relationship? No, no, because the studies haven't been done yet. But we do know a couple of things. We know that the states are managing CWD by increasing offtake, typically by human hunters. And we know from countless studies that gray wolves are very good at selecting disease compromised prey. Consequently, one and one equals two. There is really no common sense doubt that wolf predation should serve as some sort of an assist to arresting the extent and distribution of chronic wasting disease. It's not the silver bullet. Wolves are not going to cause chronic wasting disease to go away. But it is such an insidious problem, it would seem to me, that state game agencies would be excited to employ every technique possible, including predation by native carnivores to manage chronic wasting disease. Yeah, it would seem like that's, it would seem as though, and I'm not, you know, it, it's a no brainer that you have this, this engine, this species that can select, it's their pre, you know, it, it's in their genetic makeup to find the animal that is weak, diseased, young, old, injured, whatever it is, and make, and make that kill so that they can feed their family themselves, their pack, everything of that nature. Yeah, yeah. And, and let me point out, m many of your listeners may not understand, why are gray wolves so hardwired to select animals that are predisposed to predation? And this doesn't mean that a gray wolf wouldn't kill a healthy elk or a healthy deer. It means mm -hmm. that typically they can't. And, and here's why they can't. They're not really well built for their lifestyle. Right. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> they are substantially smaller than all of their prey. <laughs> right. Average white tailed deer, a small white tailed deer is bigger than a gray wolf. Gray mm -hmm. wolves, on average, in yeah. the northern Rocky Mountains, if you took a hard look, uh, males here in this country might weigh 100 pounds, females weigh 90 pounds. In the Great Lakes states, uh, males probably weigh, on average, about 85 to 90 pounds, females weigh about 70 pounds. So they're not especially large. They're always killing something bigger than themselves. Now, mm -hmm. I also want to make a point here. It doesn't mean a gray wolf doesn't kill a rabbit on occasion. That's yeah. true. Right. But gray wolves have evolved to kill things bigger than themselves. If you want to know the fundamental ecological difference between gray wolves and coyotes, coyotes are hardwired to kill things, for the most part, that are smaller than themselves. Gray wolves, for the most part, are hardwired to kill things bigger than themselves. Now, so they're, they're not big enough to make their killing easy. Their body's not well formed for the task. For example, their teeth 
uh, grow to a certain size and stop and they wear down and they break. You know, a beaver, a big gnawing road, the beaver has ever growing teeth. That's a good strategy. If you're gnawing your <laughs> way through life, gray wolf's right. teeth don't grow forever. Yeah. The nose right. of a gray wolf reduces the clamping power of, of, the, of, the, of its bite. But you look at a cougar, that shorter nose increases the power of its bite at the tips of the canines. That long nose of the gray wolf doesn't help that much. When you look at a gray wolf's front legs, you notice how they're lightly muscled. Compare the gray wolf forelimbs to the forelimbs of a cougar or a black bear or a grizzly bear. Cougars and black bears, grizzly bears, their front legs can supinate. They can reach yep. around and grab. Mm. Gray wolves don't reach around and grab. And you look at their feet. Look at their feet. Their feet are fine for traveling, and that's important. There's an old Russian proverb that says a wolf is kept fed by its feet. They're good at traveling, but otherwise their feet aren't much help for killing stuff. In contrast, look at a cougar's foot big and strong and powerful and they've taken the point of their nails to an extreme by keeping keeping them retractable and only putting them out when they're absolutely needed or oh, the big heavy feet of a grizzly bear and those big heavy claws that's not a gray wolf's foot gray wolves are not well suited for the task at hand that's why it's a it's a it's a risky and largely failed proposition years ago i did a study on this notion of risk i did a study of 225 skulls of gray wolves from Alaska when I, when I was working in Alaska, 225 skulls of gray wolves that had been killed by the Alaska Department of Fish and Game to minimize predation pressure on a local caribou herd or a moose population. So I was looking at skulls from animals that had been shot. The skulls were cleaned up so I could see clearly what the skull could tell me. I was looking at these skulls for evidence of blunt force trauma. How often did they get kicked in the head by a moose, for example? Fully a quarter of the skulls showed a broken nose, broken jaw, broken skull. It's difficult to make a living in the woods with your teeth. Rolf Peterson, who has studied wolves on Isle Royal National Park since 1972, Rolf told me, I have never done a necropsy of a gray wolf. A necropsy is just an autopsy of an animal. Rolf has never done a necropsy of a gray wolf from Isle Royal that has not shown evidence of blunt force trauma, broken nose, broken rib, broken leg. It's difficult making a living in the woods with your teeth. It's a risky proposition and it's largely a failed proposition. Countless studies have shown that most hunting attempts by gray wolves fail. Seven, eight times out of 10, gray wolves come up empty pawed. And that's why their system is designed for feast or famine. They go many, many, many days without eating anything. And then they gorge themselves. For a gray wolf to maintain good physical condition, it needs to consume an average of about seven to 10 pounds of food a day. Well, they don't eat every day. They go many days without it. So they make up for it by being able to gorge. With all of that, now you may fairly ask the question, well, how is it, Mike, the gray wolves have been so wildly successful? Because they were wildly successful, widely distributed against all of their liabilities. Gray wolves have two assets, two assets that more than make up for their liabilities. First and foremost, they are doggedly determined. A gray wolf gets up every morning, I'm sorry, every evening, and she goes to work. They're doggedly determined and they are supremely social. They're one of the most social mammals in the world. They find strength in numbers. There's that Rudyard Kipling poem, Law of the Jungle. Some of the lines read, it is the strength of the pack is the the, the wolf and the strength of the wolf is the pack. They are doggedly determined. They are supremely social. Uh, for people that are worried about wolves and ungulates, they have to understand that it's a very difficult life that the wolf has chosen. And for the most part, we know now from the Great Lakes states, decades of work from the Great Lakes states and the northern Rocky Mountains, that wolves and big game hunting can get along just fine. Thank you very much. So this seems to support the idea that wolves manage themselves to a degree and, and maybe their shortcomings and challenges assist them in that. But having said that, how do you feel about um, the lethal management of wolves once they're back in the landscape? Is it necessary or is it just inevitable? Oh, I suspect if you have a vibrant, viable wolf population in a relatively humanized landscape, and I would consider the Great Lakes states to be relatively humanized, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan. 
and the northern Rocky Mountains, Montana, was, or Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho. On occasion, you need to have access to lethal control to resolve a problem. <laughs> yes, permits, yeah. I, I believe that to be the case. Lethal control to resolve a problem is, however, a fundamentally different proposition than a very liberal recreational killing program. What's going on in the northern Rocky Mountains and what's imagined for the Great Lakes states now that the federal government is no longer overseeing wolf conservation. These are needlessly liberal killing programs for recreational purposes only. And I find that offensive. Now, I also believe that we should work on wildlife restoration, not because we want to give largely white men something more to kill. I think we got enough stuff to kill. I think the world would be a more peaceful and prosperous place if we killed less stuff. So I'm not a fan of liberal recreational killing programs. Uh, just not. I just don't think that, that we should disregard life. So as a state legislator, I brought important bills that aim to stop needless recreational killing. I brought one bill that was so important to me that it prompted me to no longer be able to stand with my Senate colleagues in prayer. In the Montana Senate, we would begin every session with a prayer, typically to a Christian God, and then we would pledge allegiance, and then we'd sit down and we'd do our work. Okay, so in my last legislative session, I brought a bill. I brought a bill to the Senate that said, uh, in Montana, we ought not be able to torture coyotes to death. We may not be able to run coyotes over with a snowmobile to kill them. That's akin to torturing. And I said to the committee that received the bill, I said, you know, you can still hunt coyotes. You can still use your snowmobile to get close. You can still use your snowmobile to run that coyote in the ground so that animal can't move another inch. But at that point, when it's laying there looking up at you, you have to dispose of it humanely and quickly. You have to shoot it in the head, hit it in the head with a bat, do something to kill it quickly. You can't run it over repeatedly with your snow machine. Well, the bill didn't make it out of committee. So as is my right as a sitting senator, I said to the full Senate, I said, I, I'm, I present this motion. I move that we remove that bill from that committee, bring it to the full Senate floor so we can have a proper debate about the wisdom of allowing coyotes to be tortured to death in Montana. And I said to my colleagues, on both sides of the aisle. I said, if we knew of a 12 year old boy in our neighborhoods that was using his bike to run over the neighborhood cat, we would have concerns for that boy's mental health. Well, this <laughs> right. is really no different than that. Montana is better than torturing something to death. Please vote with me on this procedural motion to bring the bill to a proper debate. That motion died on a party line vote. From that point forward, I could no longer stand in prayer of my Republican colleagues. I have to believe God likes coyotes, and yet they want me to pray to their God behind them, and yet they won't stand in defense of God's creation. From that point forward, every time we would pray, I would quietly and politely step into the ante room, wait for the prayer to conclude, and I'd step back into the chamber for the Pledge of the Allegiance. I just could no longer find the capacity to tolerate the hypocrisy. Now that's a long-winded way of saying I'm not a fan of needless recreational killing. That's different than lethal control of gray wolves when non-lethal techniques for resolving a problem have not worked. It's uh, it, it's it's wild that you're bringing this up right now because just recently, I think two days ago, I saw a video of this of of, of a gentleman running over a coyote in a snowmobile, and then once uh, that coyote was compromised another guy shot it. And I thought this must be a one of a kind situation, but judging by what you're saying, this was a widely known or at least potentially widely used method of, of coyote hunting. Well, it's certainly lawful and that's the problem. Mm. Is it practiced by a lot of varmint hunters? No. If it's done by anybody, it's done too much. Yeah. And my aim with my little bill was to simply say, no, not, not in Montana, not, not, not in Montana. My bill failed. 
And all I had left was to decide I could no longer stand in prayer with people that felt it was appropriate to allow Montanans to torture coyotes to death. Yeah. Hmm. What do you think, in your opinion, after, I mean, you've been in the throes of this for well over 30 years as a biologist and as a politician, what do you feel is the, the cause of why this is such a polarizing issue in terms of the hunting, the trapping, the consistent lethal um, control of these carnivores. Because as the more that we talk on this podcast with biologists and people such as yourself who have been in the field for all this time, there seems to be this evidence that there, there can be coexistence with these predators, be it bears, be it wolves, coyotes, foxes even. What do you think is the overriding factor as to why this is still a deeply held belief that these things still need to happen across the landscape? Oh, well, John, it's a great question. Thank you. Uh, I, I, would, I, would, I would observe two things. I think that we increasingly are a nation of ecological illiterates. We, we don't have an understanding of how the natural world operates. We don't value how the natural world operates. We tend to see ourselves as separate from and typically above the natural world. So consequently, we don't value predation as an exceedingly important ecological process because we're literate. I could make a case that we could assume that we will all agree that life is a very powerful force. Life is a very important force throughout the universe. We've looked hard for evidence of life, and we haven't found it anywhere but here. If life is a very, very important force, then death is nearly equally important because it's the opposite of life. So if you are a, 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 a an organism that survives by delivering death, you have to matter to the ecological processes that define life. Yes. Predation is a very, very important ecological process. But clearly, because we treat predators with such disdain, we don't understand the ecological importance of predation. I would have you believe in part because we're literate. Specific to gray wolves beyond that, is the mythical wolf is such a powerful force. People have this sense that the gray wolf has these supernatural abilities to exercise its predatory will on a whim, and that wherever it goes, it creates a wake of death and destruction. Now, nothing could be further from the truth. The real wolf is not even a shadow of its mythical self. Unfortunately, the myth is as strong as it is wrong. And until we set the myth aside, we're going to continue to see the species in a jaundiced light. And that jaundiced view allows people to treat it most inappropriately. So I think the myth gets in the way of a more enlightened relationship with gray wolves. And I think our, uh, the fact that we are literate uh, gets in the way of a more enlightened relationship with the gray wolf and carnivores in general. And even when the reality with a capital R just can't deny that they are not a threat to people, it just doesn't seem to override the myth. No. Indeed, it, it is really interesting that gray wolves are such a non-threat to human safety. If you're willing to take a good look at reliable information, and, 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 and that's all science is. Science is just good, reliable information, ideally systematically accumulated to minimize the influence of bias. Uh, the best science tells us that gray wolves were the first domesticated animal. Thousands of years ago, uh, early hunter-gatherer Pleistocene men and women and their tribes almost surely had a rather collegial and intimate relationship with gray wolves. Uh, and I think that relationship generated benefits for both. Now, I would be the first to admit it takes a long time to go from a gray wolf to a chihuahua. 
but it, it seems equally clear that the gray wolf and early hunter gatherers, people that would look just like us, had a close relationship with one another. Why it is now so very different, I can only guess that it has to do with our increasing disconnect from the natural world, which fuels this illiterate perspective. What have you learned over the course of your your professional career, your political career, I'll say professional in, in a biological sense, from each wolf recovery, what are some of the things that you have taken with you as we move into this Colorado effort, hopefully in 23, that you learned early on from, you know, 86 through 97 with those two wolf recovery projects? Well, I appreciate the work from 86 to 97, but of course, uh, from 97 through today, I have remained involved in wolf recovery and conservation and research on a near daily basis, just working through the Turner Endangered Species Fund. So let, let's let's say uh, 86 to 2020. How long is that? That's 34 years. <laughs> long time. 34 yeah. years in the train. And actually, I was involved with the work back in 1980. So for all intents and purposes, it's a 40-year run at this point. Uh, here's what I've learned. The world is run by those who show up. And I keep emphasizing to folks in Colorado, for example, if you want the restoration project that is now mandated because of the passage of Proposition 114 in November of 2020, if you want that restoration mandate to be acted upon in a manner that is thoughtful of gray wolves and accommodating of, as, of gray wolves, you need to show the hell up. Every day you need to show up and make sure that your thoughts about accommodation and respect are heard by the decision makers, the senior staff at Colorado Parks and Wildlife, the uh, individuals who are honored to serve on the Parks and Wildlife Commission in the state of Colorado need to hear your voice. Every time they convene to officially listen, the world is run by those who show up. So when you, have you, do you know of any steps that are already being taken. I know it only got passed this past November in 20. I know we're only a few months out, out of that. Do you know of any initial steps that are being taken to start the project and get it off the ground? Are you and the, 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 uh, the TESF, the Turner Endangered Species Fund, involved in any way? I know I think I read on the website, you guys are, you know, in the preliminary stages. Is there anything you can tell us, tell anyone that's listening where that stands at the moment? Oh, John, thank you. There's a lot underway. Uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife and the Parks and Wildlife Commission that serve Coloradans are uh, actively working to honor the restoration mandate. And, and the law now reads that after statewide planning to develop a restoration document, Colorado Parks and Wildlife is required to begin reintroductions by the 31st of December, 2023. So they have begun the process. They have outlined some ideas as to how they intend to get from A to Z. They're having their second wolf working meeting tomorrow. They being senior staff from Colorado Parks and Wildlife working directly with the Parks and Wildlife Commission to begin firming the, the, the anatomy of the planning effort and how that planning effort will conclude with a document that sketches how to go forward through reintroductions. So yes, the state of Colorado is taking the charge leveled by passage of Proposition 114 seriously. Now, personally, I would have preferred that they would have begun all of this on November 5th, when it was clear that the proposition passed. Mm -hmm. I think they left some valuable time unused between passage of Proposition 114 and what appeared to be rather clear engagement by the state at the beginning of 2021. But I can't go back in time. What I can say is that <laughs> Colorado Parks and Wildlife is taking this charge seriously, and they are trying to make daily progress mindful that they have a hard deadline of December 31, 2023 to begin reintroductions. 
How do you think that the decision to make the vote a public vote rather than a decision made by biologists is going to affect this process, if at all? Well, the, that, 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 yeah, Stephen, that's a very insightful uh, observation. It was a, it was a central point offered by opponents to Proposition 114. They said, oh, no, 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 you shouldn't vote for this. It represents ballot box biology. Mm. We should let the professional biologists decide on the merits of wolf restoration. It's a technical issue. To that, I say bullshit. (laughs) And here's why. Here's why. If you're willing to take a look at existing state law, it already, forget Proposition 114, forget it. State law already says wolf restoration has to be decided by the legislature, not professional biologists, the Uh, legislature, the elected mm -hmm. officials that don't Mm -hmm. know squad about wolf recovery necessarily. (laughs) I see. And you know what? Guess what? Guess what? Legislators are elected at the ballot box. Right. And if they get to decide on wolf restoration. It really already was ballot box biology. Okay. I see. Hold that thought. <laughs> I also understood as a wildlife biologist and an elected official, the shortcomings of policy by the ballot box. I get it. I get it. It's hard to get policy right when you sit down at the decision-making table week after week and you slog through the details. I get it. I get the fact that a lot of folks that sign a clipboard in the parking lot of Walmart don't have a clue what they're really signing up for. I get it. So when we wrote Proposition 114, we did a very good job stitching together the strength of direct democracy and the strength of science. In other words, the authority of biologists that work for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Mm. And, And how did we do that? We left 114 the proposition, silent on nearly all of the technical issues related to wolf restoration. We we didn't answer the technical questions that should be left to the scientists. We didn't say where the donor population should be based. We didn't say where gray wolves should be let go. We didn't say how many should be let go. We didn't say how many males and how many females and this, that, and the other. We left all the technical stuff undefined in celebration of science as the great platform for deciding questions to those answers. We built 114 as largely an aspirational goal. And we said to Coloradans, if you aspire to have wolves as part of the state's future, vote yes. With that future defined by your scientists. If you aspire for Colorado to remain wolfless, vote no. So it really isn't a firm expression of ballot box biology. They glommed onto that argument because it resonated in the court of public opinion. But it's another case where it's based on an analysis that's an inch deep and a mile wide. If they'd just taken time to actually study the issue, they would have realized it's not true. Now, the fact is we know from all kinds of campaigns, lots of campaigning is based on falsehoods. Mm -hmm. That one included. Mike, in your career as you've, as you've evolved, as you've progressed, we, I know we were talking about your generation and now this younger generation coming up. We've interviewed a lot of younger biologists who they, they've had these impactful moments in their life where wolves have become the, the driving force or part of the driving force for them to get into this field. Do you see that shift from your perspective that there is more of the younger generation taking up the mantle to become conservationists, become biologists, go in the field and really study and protect the natural landscape more so now than maybe say when you started back in 1980? Yeah, I don't know. No, I I, I haven't seen that trend. Mm. Uh, I'm not saying that the trend's not real. I'm simply saying I haven't seen it, but but I haven't spent my working career in academia. I have lots of colleagues that are academics and and they would be better suited to answer that question. I, I don't profess to understand the roster of undergraduate students. The students that we work with are deeply talented, but I, I think there's always been a roster of deeply talented students. Uh, I think at a minimum, what I would say is that I, I, I suspect young professionals or young people who aspire to be professionals 
understand that there's lots of ways to contribute. You, you don't have to be a wildlife biologist to make substantive contributions to conservation of our natural resources. Uh, the law is a most powerful tool for moving us forward as a collective to do a better job by Mother Earth. As a matter of fact, I, I'm not so sure if I was if I was 16 or 17 today, would I aspire to be a biologist or a very effective attorney? I might choose the latter mm. as a way to more efficiently improve circumstances. I got stuck into an idea that when I was 12 years old back in 1970, uh, I saw on my parents' little black and white TV that, that it was a little bitty black and white TV. We only got four channels, ABC, CBS, NBC, and public <laughs> broadcasting. You know, you guys might have a hard time believing that. But, no, and and I remember watching an early uh, <laughs> an early, an early uh, airing of the National Geographic special portraying the pioneering grizzly bear research of John and Frank Craig in, Craighead in Yellowstone National Park. I was 12, and I said, I want to do that. that that's what I want to do. I want to do that. Uh, I think uh, about 20 years later, I had bested the Craigheads. I was working in Yellowstone Park with a large carnivore, but not studying one that was in place, but rather helping to restore one that had been extirpated. So mm. I, I got this, this path stuck in my head a long time ago and, and, and never really thought, beyond the notion that I'm going to be a field biologist. Would I have that same sense today? I'm not real sure. I do believe there's lots of ways to contribute. And uh, being a field biologist is just one. But, but honestly, John, I don't know if there's more students enrolled in, in the courses that would lead to field biology or not. I, I, I don't know. I can tell you, I think uh, in, in Toto, the American citizenry is no more engaged in conservation than they were in the past opportunities are slipping through our fingertips. We're a country that has not risen to the challenge of climate change, for example. Uh, worldwide, I think it's true that the extinction crisis is one of humanity's most pressing problems. I believe it's the clarion call for change because it is a vivid example of uh, our, our, uh, the, our relationship with Mother Earth being way off kilter. And in contrast to these other problems, uh, there is no workaround for extinction. I had lots of workarounds on the climate change problem. Most of my legislative career was invested in energy policy and efforts to move to a new energy future as redress for climate change. Uh, lots of ways to get from A to Z. I have no way around extinction. It is so very absolute. It offers no workarounds. Yeah. And I feel like um, some something that's happening recently or, or maybe – you know, I was too young to notice it always happening is that the world just seems to be slowing down our progress because of the extreme polarization of all these groups. And it, it, it feels like we're more gullible than ever. And we're just sponges for all this, you know, the, this avalanche of information every day, all day that it's so hard to sift through what's real and, and, and what isn't real. It makes me mildly nervous for the, for the future about whether we'll, we'll really show up to, to fix any, any of these major challenges we're facing. Um, unfortunately, I feel that way some days. Well, I think your feelings are justified. It is hard to wade through all that is presented on a daily basis. Uh, it's hard to be a good citizen. When, when I was doing talk radio, one day we were bemoaning the lack of participation in a Bozeman City Commission race. And during the broadcast, I had an epiphany. And I said on air, stay the hell home. I hope you people stay the hell home and don't vote. Don't vote, because if I'm the only one voting, I can act as a benevolent dictator. And it may be true that the best form of government is a benevolent dictatorship. The problem is it's hard to find a benevolent dictator. And, and that drifted the conversation in the direction saying, well, the most important thing you can do as a citizen is to vote. I think that's bullshit. That's not the most important thing you can do. The most important thing you can do is cast an informed vote. That's mm. a hard thing to do, mm. casting an informed vote. Shit, oh dear, if everybody votes and half the votes are uninformed and my informed vote is an informed vote, my informed vote doesn't mean much because it's competing with all these uninformed votes. 
Right. Uh, nobody says, well, we're not going to count that vote. That's an uninformed vote. That, that, that vote, <laughs> vote's going to count for two because it's, it's an informed vote. My kids went to an elementary school one time, and the principal, in the presence of an important gubernatorial campaign in Montana, he had the kids vote. He said, are you going to vote for person A or person B? And, and I said to the principal, why would you ask them that? They're just going to parrot what their parents said if they parrot anything. And their parents may be screwballs. Why don't you ask the kids something they know about? Okay, okay, we've got an important election in Montana. We're going to have one here in the school, too. We're going to vote today to decide whether we have chocolate or vanilla ice cream on Friday. That's a vote you can invest yourself in. I know why I like chocolate ice cream. The idea that the act of citizenry of this country is voting is ridiculous. That's a cop-out. That's a cheap conclusion. What you have to do is cast an informed vote. That's hard. Man. It's yeah, I, I agree with that. And it, it, it's more, it's more so prevalent now than ever before. I, it, it, with that being said for you, what do you see as the path for you, for yourself, for the TESF, for Colorado Wolf introduction, where, where do you see the path moving forward for the projects that you were all involved in? Is there do you see the momentum building and going forward in a way that you, you can still make these changes now that you are out of uh, politi- you know, state legislature and things of that sort, that you are, th- there's still an avenue for you to make change? Sure. It, it, thank you. Of course there is, because we simply will not be denied. Uh, we show up early and go home late every day. We, we won't be denied. Uh, with our projects. And for the most part, my legislative career didn't touch on my work with the Turner Endangered Species Fund and the Turner Biodiversity Divisions. I I did that as a private citizen. And and just so folks know, I don't want people to believe that I get 25 hours in a day. I don't. I only get 24, just like the rest of us. Uh, I I did that as a private citizen. In, In Montana, our legislature meets every second year for 90 days. So it was something akin to taking what would amount to be about a full month sabbatical from my day job every every second year. And, and then I would serve on interim committees that would meet outside of the regular legislative session, but it was all very manageable. I only lived 90 minutes from the Capitol. And, and so it worked for me to continue to be a conservation scientist and a legislator as well. With our work at Team Turner, we're very good at coming up with ideas that matter. We're very good at punching above our weight. We're not very big, but we are mighty because we have a good nose for the game and we embrace projects that we know matter. We don't embrace projects that we can't handle. Our reach equals our grasp. We, we don't mislead people. What the state and federal governments see from us is exactly what they get from us. And, and because of all of those things, our projects will continue to mature. For example, we have this fantastic effort building in New Mexico that will involve reintroductions of bolson tortoises in 2021. The bolson tortoise is the biggest tortoise in North America. Uh, our big animals weigh 30 or 40 pounds. They're big tortoises. They're closely related to the Galapagos tortoise. The bolson is a fantastic species. It was a desert dwelling species, not known to science before the late 1950s. But here's where things get really interesting. The bolson tortoise, Gopherus flavomarginatus is a scientific name, Gopherus flavomarginatus. It's known in Spanish as tortuga grande because they're so big. The bolson tortoise has not occupied the United States for 10, 15, 20,000 years. It is truly a relic species from the Pleistocene. In 2009, in one of our big enclosures that hold our adults, the enclosure is really a two foot high chicken wire fence. It doesn't keep anything out. It just keeps these big tortoises in. In 2009, we found a little bitty guy known as 09DW1. 09DW1 was was the tortoise's name. 09 stood for 2009. DW stood for deep well. That was the location, the deep well pin. And number one, well, number one stood for number one. Zero nine DW1 was the first bolson tortoise born in the wild in the United States in 15,000 years. We will build on zero nine DW1 in 2021 by releasing 
uh, tortoises to the wilds of the Armanderas Ranch and the latter ranch in an attempt to restore viable populations of this relic from the Pleistocene. That's just a really exciting example of the work that we do at Team Turner every day. We're very good at finding unique ways of contributing. And so, John, for those reasons, our work will continue even though I'm no longer a state legislator. And, and regardless of what happens in, in Colorado, specific to the Colorado Wolf Project, I believe it will go forward. I know that Colorado Parks and Wildlife has more than enough talent to do a top shelf job restoring gray wolves to the great public wildlands of Western Colorado. And it doesn't take much at this point to let the genie out of the bottle. All you have to do to cast the die of restoration is let 30, 40, 50, 60 wolves go, and they will take care of the rest. What we did with passage of Proposition 114 was tee up the bottle so we can let the genie out. And again, that will occur with the release of 30, 40, 50 wolves. I think CPW is going to get that done, and we'll move on to the next big conservation opportunity. It was 25 years in the making. If I didn't have faith in the state government, I don't agree that the government's the problem. If government is the problem, that's our problem because the government is us. I I, I love that because you you've had we we've had two consecutive between yourself and Carter Niemeyer, who have really shown the balance that and the and the and really the fortitude that can be done with private citizens, public citizens, and the government. I I want to ask really the final question to you. And again, thank you for sharing your stories with us and sharing your efforts and, and for all the work that you do and you continue to do um, it, it, where you are. When you, when you hear the word wolf, what is the thing that comes up for you? Justice. I mean, sir, you, you, you've left what seems like no stone unturned and we appreciate you for it. You're, you truly are a commanding voice and I'm, I'm, I'm activated even more so because of it. And I think if we had to trust only one person with the job, of course, it, it will take a village. But if we had to trust one person with changing the hearts and minds of people, I, I would put my money on you. So thank you for being here with us and, and hopefully we will meet you one day. Well, fellas, it was my honor and thank you for what you're doing and, and thank you for the chance to offer some thoughts. Yeah, Absolutely. Mike, give, if you can, just give people a place, social media, website, place where they can go and see where they can keep up to date, maybe on the Colorado Wolf effort, where, where they can find TESF and TBD, uh, the Turner Biodiversity Division, the Turner Endangered Species Fund, and any other works that, that they can follow you and see where projects are going. Yeah, well, the simplest way, John, thank you. Uh, you could Google Rocky Mountain Wolf Project or www.rockymountainwolfproject.org. And the same for the Turner Endangered Species Fund, just www.tesf.org. Of the two, of the two, your listeners should pay most attention to the Rocky Mountain Wolf Project. It is a Colorado-based effort. That's true. But the landscape of relevance to wolf restoration in Colorado are these millions and millions of acres of federal public lands that all Americans can take pride in, all Americans can claim, claim ownership to. Consequently, wolf restoration in Colorado is a national issue. And if folks are interested, www.rockymountainwolfproject.org is a, a good way to dial in. Awesome. Mike Phillips, thank you so much. Thank you. We will get this out to to everyone. Uh, Howls to all of you out there. And Stephen and I will talk to you next time. Bye, everyone. Bye. Looking to support Wolf Connection or sponsor one of the wolves in our pack? Just go to wolfconnection.org, click on the Donate tab, and find out more information. 